live live stream. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, hello, Minglawa. Uh, 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 good morning, Lauren. And uh, good morning. Uh, Alo di ni jenaru di pentingkan nebiro CME program pono jenaru go online kan nebiro pinida asal jenaru saya jemia sibi saya jemia mah di ni pucat men lecture sub tissue coverage pono open fracture sub tissue coverage jenaru di ni open ni de type wear ini now di ni ya ni de dah the injury di dah ya re wound ni pono dah re blue mu Coverage slow melayu sudah hau, tapi awak mampir deh. Professor Lauren Matthew Garo, alun tibi dah, ini nak kalah tu lecture tu kubebi dah. Tu ka, pinte tangga ni biro, setangga tu nalu Professor dia mampir deh. No, setangga tu dua jam ni aisy deh. Di Afrika tu, now di Europe mampir no, aku lewe di tu Operia. Amerika kawal ini ni lari mian isi ya, bukan? Nah, lalu je Afrika ni ama tu abis itu pian lah. Ayah ni biro aku tu hotel kau tu ngale di wuni ni, bet bawa wuni ni, bet bet tapi management ni bet tapi pio pio di ni ada sub tissue coverage ni bet tapi pio mah, bukan? So, eh, biar tu naro ambil pi lesi ni, bukan? Thank you very much, Lauren and. Yeah, today's lecture is a very important, and then this is a very much, you know, helpful for us because currently we are facing the uh, that kind of, you know, open wound, and then we need to cover up all these open fractures and open wound. Your your lecture and your talk will be uh, very helpful, and then also that is very much supported for the our revolution. Thank you so much. Okay. Now flow is yours. Flow is yours. I, I also like to thank the Professor Jerome Seidigosi because he has been organizing and then I think uh, he, he been he been up in the very early morning every Saturday Sunday with <laughs> us. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Jerome. Thank you. Now, Flo, is your Thank Laurie. you very much, Dr. Zong. So I will I will stop. Thank you. I will try to share my screen now. Okay. Uh, Can you see my, my screen? No, pas encore. Il faut. Pas encore. Un non, petit peu on, de temps. on ne voit pas. Ah, alors. Il faut l'ouvrir peut-être avant. Euh, là, là, vous ne voyez pas. Okay. Non, là, on voit, le, on voit ton, ton écran, mais avec, euh, on ne voit pas la, la présentation. Ok, alors bah, je vais fermer. Hmm. Je recommence tout. Hop, euh. Voilà. Là, c'est bon, j'espère. Là, on voit ton écran. Vas-y, il faut ouvrir peut-être. Voilà. Est-ce que c'est bon Voilà, super, impeccable. Bon, parfait. Je ne suis pas très à l'aise encore avec ça, mais bon. Voilà. Ouais. <rire> Allez, ça va aller. Super. So, uh, today we will talk about uh, how to treat uh, soft tissue in open fracture in a, in a war context. So, we will see how to assess the wound, how to plan the, the coverage, and how to what are the principles of soft tissue coverage in that, uh, in that injuries. So we will talk about surgical strategy. We will talk about primary debridement, uh, about delay, uh, delay primary closure, and about the use of uh, flap transfer. We'll see what are the simple and uh, reliable uh, flap transfer that we can use in the, in the austere environment of uh, a forward uh, surgical unit or uh, uh, improvised field hospital. Uh, you will see compared to the, my previous talk about the primary management and uh, damage control, there will be, uh, there will be some repetition, uh, uh, obviously, about the, especially about the, the, the strategy and the primary development. But this is 
really the critical part of uh, any uh, management of uh, war wounds. The debridement is uh, really the, the core of the, of the treatment. And without an appropriate debridement, uh, every reconstruction will fail. So that's why it's important and to repeat a little bit uh, about uh, debridement. I already showed you before the, our strategy in limb reconstructions uh, with the two options after uh, the injury, the uh, limb salvage, and it's the upper line and the uh, primary amputation or in, in case of uh, bad evolution in the, in the following days. So this is the uh, six, seven, eight, and nine uh, sequences of the damage control orthopedics within six hours. So today we'll talk about a limb salvage. So this is the, 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 first, the first line. So ideally, ideally uh, damage control orthopedics must be uh, performed within six hours. So uh, as early as possible, in fact. Uh, we have seen the, the three pillars of damage control orthopedic, uh, hemorrhage control, uh, wound decontamination, we'll uh, detail that today again, and uh, so once this is done, uh, it is the, after, in the following days, uh, the, the next step will be the soft tissue coverage, which ideally must be achieved uh, within uh, seven days. And today we will focus on this, uh, on this second, uh, second step of soft tissue coverage. Then the, the next step will be a bone and a nerve reconstruction, which, which should be performed within uh, uh, eight week, uh, the eight, eight week, yes, to, uh, with the objective uh, of a final uh, rehabilitation and a final functional outcome uh, within nine months. And as you can see, in case of uh, limb salvage failure, we can switch to a secondary or to a late amputation. And most of the time, secondary amputation or, or sometimes late amputation, but mostly secondary amputation are due to uh, a failure of infection control. So this is very critical to uh, avoid or to control infection uh, during uh, the, the, uh, the, this, this first week. So we will now we'll detail the, um, how, to, how to do it, how to do it during the, the, the DCO procedure and during the, the, the first week. So this is the, the different step of uh, management. I already uh, show you uh, this, uh, this different step, but today we will, we will detail a little bit. So we'll start from primary assessment uh, we'll talk about uh, debridement, secondary assessment of the wound once the primary assessment is done, and we'll talk about uh, delay primary closure. And, you, as, and as you will see, we will have to perform before an ultimate assessment after an ultimate debridement. So the, the day you will close the wound, it will, not, it will be a different wound than the first day because the, of the evolution of the tissue and because of the frequent requirement of serial debridement uh, before you can uh, close, the, close the wound. So start with the primary assessment. Uh, so it is uh, important when we uh, the um, patient arrive in your in your facility like this uh, with uh, compressive dressing with tourniquet sometimes. So it is important at first to uh, uh, open the dressing and reassess the the tourniquet uh, utility. And before entering the OT. So this is the, uh, you must have a, a clear idea of what you will have to treat in, in the OT, of course. Uh, just to remind you, you can, of course, uh, um, remove the tourniquet if the patient is uh, stable. If not, you remove the tourniquet only in the, in the OT. So once you examine the, 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 the wound, three questions, you have to uh, reply to three questions. Is an infection is al already present? Especially in, uh, in, uh, in the war context, the patient may be arrived late, so you will have him after a few days. So if the no debridement was performed, if the wound wasn't cleaned uh, properly, and if antibiotics didn't start early, you can already have an infection. So this is the, the, the first step. Uh, 
the infection risk, uh, of course, depends uh, on wound decontamination, on wound mechanism, on delay management, I uh, already told you, and on, uh, on an inappropriate uh, primary uh, treatment. Second question, and this is the, the, the topics today, uh, am I going to face with a soft tissue defect that I will have to reconstruct uh, later? So this is uh, sometimes evident. Uh, it depends also on the mechanism, on the wound. If you have a dirty wound, you will have to uh, debride and remove tissue, and this will increase the, the size of the soft tissue defect. You can have bone exposure or not. Uh, it will uh, condition, uh, it, um, Bone exposure on bone exposure will depend if you have to perform a flap or if you don't need to perform a flap. You can have also a compartment syndrome to treat and uh, eventual uh, nerve or vascular injury to integrate in your in your management. And then uh, you will have to choose the, your primary bone stabilization. So to to choose that, you need of course a radiological assessment and the uh, your. Uh, Stabilization means will depend on the location of the fracture, on the which bone is broken, if it's an epiphyseal, metaphyseal, or diaphyseal fracture, if it's a simple or community fracture, is there any uh, multiple fracture, and the fixation also will depend uh, on the existence or not of uh, a bone defect. So this is the primary assessment. Uh, is the wound already infected? Is there a, a soft tissue defect? And what are the, the bone uh, injury? So then you move to the to the theater and you can uh, start uh, or surgery. So the the, the primary uh, debridement and irrigation. <clears throat> I already present uh, this part, but it's very uh, critical to understand it and 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 to repeat. So in war surgery, you have uh, mostly high energy open fracture, uh, combining uh, devascularized tissues and uh, viable tissues. So to uh, perform uh, an appropriate wound decontamination, you must act on both tissue. For devascularized tissue, the only uh, way to uh, decontamine is to remove that tissue. So this is the, the debridement with wound incision and wound excision. So we'll, excise, remove uh, the tissue. But for the viable tissue, you must conserve them. And uh, to decontaminate them, you should you have to perform uh, generous irrigation combined to uh, an antibiotic uh, uh, treatment. So to perform the, the debridement, it's, I, uh, in my opinion, but, uh, some surgeons disagree with that, but in my opinion, it's better to, uh, to use a pneumatic tourniquet uh, to provide a, a bloodless field first to see exactly what you're doing and to minimize uh, the, the blood loss. It's uh, very uh, critical, especially if, if your capacity in uh, blood uh, is uh, limited. Of course, the pneumatic uh, tourniquet use must be as short as possible. And uh, it is also important to, uh, at the end of the procedure to deflate the tourniquet to assess uh, the tissue viability of the, the tissue you, you have uh, conserved. You have to check if, it's, uh, if, they are, if they bleed or not. And uh, so of course to perform the uh, hemostasis. So in my opinion, it's uh, better to use a uh, pneumatic tourniquet. So we already saw before that the debridman is in fact a two-step procedure with the wound incision to enter the uh, injury and the wound excision to remove uh, the uh, dead tissue. So we have uh, seen also that the, this wound incision uh, must be uh, generous. Uh, it must be a long incision to enter the uh, chamber of uh, at, uh, tissue attrition uh, to en enter the injury. So once again, don't look through the hole of the, uh, the, the, of the wound, but make a large approach uh, to uh, get inside. So this, uh, uh, this wound incision must be uh, longitudinal most of the time. Uh, and this is the, the better way to uh, uh, approach the, the permanent cavity 
to perform a proper decompression to avoid uh, compartment syndrome and uh, to permit uh, uh, a very good uh, drainage at the end since you will not close the, the skin. So if you perform a large incision and you don't uh, close the skin, you will have an appropriate drainage. In case you have a, a, an articular or open fracture to, to manage, then you uh, must uh, use a conventional joint approach. So you can find this in any uh, surgical books. For example, uh, the management of this uh, open distal uh, femur fracture, uh, you see the, the skin incision and we uh, reach uh, uh, a parapatellar lateral approach. So there is some specificities for uh, a joint injury, but uh, most of the time, if, if it's not joint injury, uh, a longitudinal incision uh, is uh, preferred. So the second step is wound excision to remove the dead tissue. So we move from the uh, superficie, uh, superficial to the deep of the wound. So first the skin, skin uh, excision uh, of course should be a minimal to uh, limit the size of the defect you will have to reconstruct later. So always be uh, very uh, conservative. I avoid a, a large excision of the skin uh, at least at the beginning, and you will see in the following days what is the evolution of the of your uh, wound edge. Conversely, uh, subcutaneous fat excision must be very generous because uh, this tissue uh, has a poor blood supply and some often is uh, uh, heavily uh, contaminated. So re remove generously all the fat tissue to avoid uh, infection. Then you must uh, decompress the wound by uh, uh, an entire incision of the, uh, of the deep fascia uh, along the entire length of your skin incision. So this is the, a way to prevent compartment syndrome and uh, to uh, um, also perform a good drainage. So, uh, and this is of course uh, mandatory to expose the depth of the wound. So you incise the fascia, and in case your uh, deep fascia is uh, severed, you can excise it uh, without any 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 problem. And so you can excise if you want uh, the, the the fascia. Then you will perform the muscle the muscle uh, excision. So uh, this is uh, like fat tissue. The muscle uh, excision must be generous. Uh, and all dead and heavily contaminated muscle must be removed. Uh, we talked about that before. We use uh, usually the, 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 uh, the four C uh, rules. So your debridement is uh, performed according to the color, to the consistency, contractility, and the capillar bleeding of the muscle. If the muscle is dark, if it's uh, smooth, if, it's not, uh, if there is no contractility and no bleeding, you have to remove. So this is very critical and very difficult to do because uh, at the beginning, uh, the, the risk is to uh, excise too much muscle or at the contrary, uh, to uh, conserve a muscle that will, uh, that will uh, necrose in the, in the following uh, days and uh, lead to a secondary infection. So this is very difficult to do. And even with the experiences of the surgeon, with experienced surgeon, uh, even for them, it's difficult to do. So that's why you, we will see that most of the time we have to repeat the, uh, this wound excision uh, in, in, in order to uh, avoid a huge uh, excision, but to also to avoid infection. So this is a, we have a compromise to do and it's, uh, it's, the, it's the most difficult part. That's why I, I, um, I stress that point and that's why I show you again uh, this slide. So next is the, the, we arrive to the bone. So bone fragment with no attachment to periosteum or muscle uh, should be uh, removed because they will, uh, uh, they will um, become a sequestrum and uh, favorize the bone infection. But any uh, bone uh, fragment will still attach uh, must be retained once again to avoid uh, uh, very large uh, bone defect. So 
debridement is performed with wound incision, with wound excision, and the last step is uh, a copious uh, irrigation with normal saline using a syringe. You see, you, can, you have to use liters uh, according to the contamination of the wound, uh, three to nine liters, nine liters in case of very contaminated wound by landmine, for example. Uh, it is uh, critical to uh, make a curtage of bone ends and uh, an intramedullary uh, canal uh, irrigation, uh, as you can see uh, here, uh, like uh, any uh, open fracture. This is the basic of any open fracture management uh, with a curtage of bone end and intramedullary canal irrigation. Then, of course, you continue or start the antibiotics if, was, if it wasn't done before. Uh, to uh, prevent also infection of uh, viable tissue. Okay, so we are here in our uh, sequence. We perform the primary assessment, the uh, primary uh, de debridement and irrigation with antibiotherapy. And uh, it is also now the time to perform uh, the temporary bone fixation. We uh, detailed that uh, two weeks ago. Just to remind you, temporary bone uh, fixation in a, a damage control uh, orthopedic uh, procedure can be done either by external fixation or simple splinting for distal fracture of the end uh, of the wrist or, or of the anchor. But for long bone, uh, external, uh, temporary external fixation is preferred. We have seen that we, it's better to use a modular external fixator, uh, like you can see. As you have here, example, uh, because this uh, light fixator uh, will provide an easy and uh, fast application, but, all, but mostly a good access to soft tissue. And today we will have to we will focus on soft tissue management. And as you see, with a fixator like this, it's easy to uh, to uh, perform a new debridement. It's easy to uh, raise the flap. But for example, if you use a circular frame, you cannot do anything. So that's why it's uh, crucial to use a very simple fixator at the first step during the first day. <clears throat> external fixation may also uh, simplify uh, management of extensive soft tissue. And you can see the, this patient. This patient was victim of a, a bomb and he had no, no fracture. In fact, he have only have soft tissue injury, but he had multiple injury with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, important edema and uh, the, is, a, is a wound were very exudative. So if you use plaster in this patient, it doesn't work because after uh, one hour, because of the uh, exudate of the edema, your uh, plaster splint will be uh, totally uh, wet and there is no effect. So uh, to, um, in this case, to avoid the echinus deformity, we use a very simple fixator with one one pin in the tibia, one pin in the in the forefoot, just to prevent uh, just to prevent echinus deformity, and uh, this uh, fixator will also uh, facilitate uh, uh, the local care of the wound. So you can also use fixator even if you don't have a fracture, in in case of very extensive soft tissue injury. We have seen that the one of the critical uh, point in terms of uh, war wound at the beginning, it's to leave the wound open uh, to perform the, the, the better drainage uh, possible. So we uh, seen that uh, you, you must use a simple uh, mesh gauze uh, dressing like, uh, like this. Uh, see, this is uh, sufficient and this is what should be done uh, and during the first, uh, your first the, the primary debris, the primary management, sorry. But we also uh, discussed that there are two exceptions, but it's, it's seldom, but there are two exceptions to this rule. If you have a, a repair a vessel, if, for example, if you perform a, a artery a repair or a bypass, you must uh, uh, close the wound, of course, you cannot uh, let the uh, artery exposed. And it's the same thing if you have a, a huge uh, soft tissue defect like this exposing a joint, you, can, uh, you cannot, uh, Put a simple dressing on the joint. In this case, uh, but it's it's rare. In this case, uh, you an immediate soft tissue coverage uh, is necessary, uh, including with performance, as you can see here, 
of a simple uh, flap transfer. So, but this is the ex exception. Most of the time, uh, the wound can be uh, easily uh, uh, be left uh, open, uh, except if you have uh, uh, vessels uh, which have been repaired, very important. If the vessel wasn't repaired, no need to perform a flap, or if you have an exposed uh, joint. You can use um, negative pressure addressing. <clears throat> uh, I explained to you before that uh, in my practice, I don't use the negative pressure addressing after the first debridement because of uh, hemorrhage uh, issues. Uh, effectively, uh, you will uh, the negative pressure will uh, expose to a risk of uh, hemorrhage of bleeding if your uh, hemostasis is not perfect. So, uh, in my in my practice, I use the negative pressure dressing, but not after the first uh, the at the first debridement. But in the day after, yes, because the uh, the very uh, the strong advantage of negative pressure dressing is that it will protect the open fracture from the ambient environment. And once you have cleaned your wound, uh, if you use this kind of dressing, and if you, at the condition, you change the dressing in the OT and not in the in the ward, uh, you will uh, limit the risk of secondary contamination by uh, environmental germs. So it's a barrier to bacterial contamination from other patients or from the hospital staff. So it's we uh, use that uh, very uh, often in in our practice, but not the first day but in the following days. If you don't have the, the very good, uh, the, the proper device, you can use a, a artisanal uh, negative pressure dressing. Uh, it's possible for, for small, small wound, but not for a large wound, because here it's complicated to do. So you can make a, a negative pressure dressing, as you can see here, with a foam, with a, a adhesive uh, dressing, and with a simple drain connected to uh, uh, to vacuum. Oh, to, uh, so you can do it uh, like this, but uh, it's uh, a little bit more complicated to do and you can have a leak. Uh, so it's not easy to do for large wound once, ag uh, once again, but you can do it uh, like here for small wound. So now we arrive in the step of the secondary assessment of the wound. What is the this secondary assessment? This secondary assessment is the one you will do after your uh, debridement. Because when you will think about uh, soft tissue reconstruction, of course, as I told you, the wound after debridement is not the same than before. And if you have to perform serial debridement, uh, of course, obviously uh, the, your wound uh, will change and the size of the defect will increase. So the secondary assessment is the one you perform once you have uh, did the, the, the primary uh, debridement. So it is crucial to plan uh, your uh, soft tissue uh, coverage. So you have, once again, three questions. Is the fracture is exposed or not? Is there the soft tissue defect? And uh, how are the surrounding uh, skin uh, around the wound? in order to plan the use of a local flap. Then, you <coughs> then usually uh, we use the uh, Gustilo uh, uh, classification to uh, anticipate uh, soft tissue coverage. Uh, you know, of course, this uh, Gustilo classification, uh, it is used uh, worldwide. It is based on the uh, skin defect size and on the location of the of the defect uh, after the the the, the primary uh, de debridement. So you have a gustile one, two, three A, three B, and three uh, C. We will detail uh, each of them. So uh, a gustilo uh, type one, it's uh, an open fracture, but with a, a very small wound. Uh, under a one centimeter length and a wound which is clean. So in that case is when after you perform the, the debridement, you have a wound not so like this, less than one centimeter and clean. So you can uh, perform a direct skin closure. An, ide an ideal uh, uh, treatment in terms of uh, bone uh, fixation. In the type two, once again, uh, you evaluate the gustilo classification after the debridement. 
In the type two, uh, the wound is uh, uh, over one uh, centimeter length, and, but without uh, extensive soft tissue damage. So you have an example here. You can perform sometime, most of the time, dry skin closure, but uh, there is a little or moderate skin tension when you uh, suture the skin, which exposed to a risk of secondary skin uh, necrosis. Next, uh, type three. Type three is uh, usually an extensive uh, soft tissue damage. And this is the predominant type in, in our war practice. So we have an open fracture with an extensive soft tissue damage. There are a different kind of extensive soft tissue damage. In the uh, type 3A, there is an extensive soft tissue damage, but you have an adequate uh, soft tissue coverage of the, of the uh, fracture site, despite uh, the soft tissue injury. As you can see here, and there is a huge uh, a skin defect, but it's a posterior defect, and uh, the, uh, the fracture is not exposed. So you don't need to perform any flap in that case. You can uh, do uh, skin grafting or let uh, the wound heal by itself. So tip 3A, there is no uh, exposure of the fracture site. Conversely, on the tip 3B, there is a lot of loss of tissue and bone exposure. So in that case, uh, flat uh, coverage will be uh, required, of course, uh, to uh, perform, uh, to avoid infection and to uh, permit uh, bone union. So tip 3B, uh, it is the, the, most, the most frequent, uh, uh, and that we will talk about today, the most frequent uh, injury that you will face and the most difficult to, to treat. Uh, it's when you have to uh, a, a bone uh, exposure with a, a fracture, sometimes severe like this. And type 3C, it's uh, an open fracture associated with an arterial injury requiring repair, repair, regardless of the soft tissue injury. In this case, it was a, it's a 3, 3C injury. There is a very little uh, in opening, but the patient uh, has an, an ischemia due to uh, uh, an avulsion of the popliteal artery. So revascularization is required. This is a, a type C. So <clears throat> we perform the primary uh, assessment, debridement, secondary assessment. So uh, now uh, we will see that uh, sometimes uh, in the foot, the following days, uh, before you move to uh, the daily primary closure after uh, six days, sometimes you will have to perform uh, iterative debridement every uh, two or three days uh, uh, to prepare the wound for, for closure. This is our practice in, uh, in our military uh, environment, but this practice is a, a little bit different in, for example, uh, in uh, ICRC, they are in MSF, they told their surgeon to perform the, the DCO, to wait five days and to perform delay primary closure. So it is another, uh, another approach, another strategy. Uh, it, it works for many, many wounds, but in case of very severe wound, uh, very uh, highly contaminated wound due to landmine, for example, uh, in our practice, we add a uh, serial session of debridement before uh, the, 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 the sixth or seventh day be, before performing uh, daily primary uh, closure. So this serial debridement, as you, we perform uh, heat in highly contaminated wood like this, in, in case the demarcation between the dead and damaged tissue is not clear at all. So in, in this case, it's very difficult to, as I told you before, to uh, preserve the viable tissue and to exceed the dead one because you don't know where's the, where's the limit uh, between both. So to, to avoid extensive excision, uh, we perform this, uh, what we call a marginal, uh, marginal debridement, which must be repeated uh, every, every two days or three days. So the principle of this marginal debridement is to uh, preserve the damage but potential uh, viable tissue. Uh, 
uh, the aim once again is to avoid a huge excision that you you cannot you will uh, you cannot reconstruct after in uh, with your uh, with your resource so when you are not certain of the viability of the remaining tissue uh, you preserve them and you will see what will be the evolution uh, after a, a 48 hour so uh, this uh, simple uh, drawing uh, to explain what is a, a marginal debridement compared to a radical debridement. You have in green the tissue we, we, which are viable. You are sure uh, one hundred percent they are viable. They bleed properly. Uh, so this tissue, of course, you will preserve them. You have the dead tissue, which are tissue which are uh, obviously devascularized and will uh, uh, lead to infection. So them you will remove, but in the intermediate zone, uh, if you perform a, a radical debridement to be sure there's no infection, you have to remove this intermediate tissue. But if you do that, you will have a large defect. So in this in the situation, we don't recommend that. We recommend a marginal debridement with uh, preserving this intermediate tissue. And uh, you will uh, return to OT after two days, and you will see what is the evolution of this intermediate tissue. So this is the principle of marginal debridement. That's what we do to avoid, uh, to obtain a very large defect that will be uh, difficult to reconstruct, especially in austere environment. So, uh, okay, so this, uh, this is the, what we do in the, in the first day. Then we move to the uh, delay uh, primary closure uh, step which uh, is usually performed around the, 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 the ideally performed before uh, the, the, the seventh day, sometime at day five, sometime at, uh, at day seven, but sometime later. If you have a heavy uh, contaminating wound, like I show you, sometimes you need two or three weeks to decontaminate the wound properly to be sure that you can uh, close safely the wound uh, uh, with a limited risk of infection. So once again, this, uh, this timing is an ideal timing that you can uh, you cannot always uh, achieve. So ideally, uh, you will perform your uh, uh, delay primary closure after uh, four to uh, seven days. But before uh, performing it, uh, you must uh, achieve an ultimate debridement and an ultimate wound assessment. So. Uh, at, uh, at day seven, for example, uh, you, you uh, bring the patient to the OT, you remove the, uh, the dressing, and if the wound is clean, uh, if there's no sign of infection, you can perform an ultimate debridement. So you need to uh, debride the, the, the wound again, uh, to excise the, the edge of the wound, and wash again, and then you can close if it's, uh, if it's clean. If it's not, you have to perform uh, an iterative debridement and uh, sometimes one, two, or three debridement, and you will postpone your uh, wound closure. So once, uh, if the wound is clean, you have performed the ultimate uh, wound, ex wound excision, and you will perform uh, now the ultimate assessment. And it is only now that you will uh, see the real size of the uh, soft tissue defect you will have to reconstruct. And uh, it is always, always larger than you uh, initially expect. So, uh, so be aware of that. Uh, when you uh, see a patient with a soft tissue defect at day one, you, when you will uh, close the wound at day five or six, uh, the wound will be larger than you, you expect. So this is a, a typical example of, the, uh, of this patient with a victim of a landmine. And you see on the, on, on the first day, we had uh, an exposure of uh, uh, eight to uh, four centimeter. And uh, after a few days of serial debridement, uh, this become a 15 to 10 centimeter uh, uh, soft tissue defect with a large uh, bone exposure. So uh, always remember that the skin defect is always larger than you, you think uh, initially. So to close the wound, to reconstruct the soft tissue, <coughs> there are various options. Various options. 
Uh, from the more simple is the wound healing to the more complicated, which is a, a, flap, a free flap coverage. And you have this uh, uh, increasing difficulty. Uh, but, uh, and in our practice, in war practice, we always, always choose the simplest way. Uh, you can you can perform sometimes uh, complicated uh, uh, flap coverage, uh, but if you uh, if you can uh, do it more simply with uh, skin grafting, for example, uh, it's it's preferable because the, the more complicated the procedure, the more complicated the complication, and uh, especially in uh, an austere environment. So we always choose the simplest way between secondary healing, direct skin closure, of course, skin grafting, and pedicle uh, flap uh, coverage. As you can see here, I will not speak today about the free flap coverage because me, I'm ortho, I'm not a plastic surgeon. So first, I, I have no few experiences of free flap, but mostly I will not talk about that because it's not uh, achievable on the field. You know, the conditions are not good for to perform a uh, free flap uh, coverage. So we will see now this different uh, treatment. Secondary link, secondary link of the wound is particularly uh, indicated for this kind of superficial wound without fracture exposure. Typically, it's a patient with a secondary blast huh, with multiple soft tissue uh, injury, uh, but no fracture. So in this case, the secondary link uh, is uh, most of the time sufficient, but it can take time. So to uh, accelerate uh, granulation tissue formation, you can use uh, uh, secondary uh, negative pressure therapy. This is a good uh, indication for uh, negative wound therapy. Direct skin closure, uh, of course, uh, is the, the more straightforward uh, way to close the wound, uh, direct, uh, direct suture. It's indicated for wound uh, without skin defect or with a minimal skin defect. Uh, we have seen that if you have a skin defect and if you perform a direct suture under tension, uh, you, you expose the, the wound to a secondary skin necrosis. So uh, be aware of that. Uh, avoid when you can uh, suture under tension uh, to avoid a, a secondary skin necrosis. Just uh, note that uh, the suture uh, with undertation is only possible when you have a skin that is flexible and mobilized. It's easy on at, uh, at the tight level like this. It's much more complicated at the ankle level. You cannot perform uh, skin suture under minimal tension at the uh, ankle level because the skin is not flexible at all. But at the tight level like this, it's possible. Uh, skin grafting now, two kinds of uh, skin uh, graft. Uh, first, the uh, split uh, thickness skin graft. They are indicated for skin defect without a fracture exposure. So it is typically the uh, Gustilo 3A injury. So like I as I showed you before, like this, you have a, a, a fracture with a soft tissue defect, but the fracture is not exposed. So you can uh, apply uh, your uh, thin uh, skin grafting on skin graft on the muscle. You can also use a split uh, thickness skin graft on a tendon or on a, um, vessel or a nerve. That was there is a mistake. That was not uh, injured. That was not repair. Huh? You can use uh, skin grafting on vessel or nerve, but at the condition they are intact. There's a mistake here, not repair, it's intact. But it's better to, for that to, uh, 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 sorry, uh, yes, it's okay. And without tendon, yes, I, I said, without tendon or uh, vessel uh, exposed. It's okay, there is no mistakes. <laughs> uh, but if you have, uh, a fracture uh, with a skin defect and uh, a bone exposure like uh, Gustilo 3B injury, or if you have a tendon or a exposure or a vessel or nerve that have been repaired, you must perform a pedicle a flap transfer. 
Uh, it, we'll uh, talk about that now. And uh, this is a very frequent case, of course, in, uh, in a war uh, practice. Uh, we uh, mostly face Gustilo 3B injury or uh, a vessel that have been repaired, and we uh, need to uh, cover uh, to avoid uh, secondary complication. So now uh, we will see what are the uh, simple and reliable uh, flat transfer that you can use for the coverage of open fracture in the context of war in the field. So I will only present you a flat transfer that a non-specialized surgeon can perform with a limited resource. In our practice in, uh, in the field, we don't have, uh, most of the time we don't have plastic surgeons. So if when we manage local patient that we cannot evacuate uh, to France, uh, the ortho surgeon must perform by himself the, 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 flap, uh, the flap transfer. So we are trained to perform some uh, very simple flap transfer that with uh, which we can manage uh, most of the cases. So of course, the main problem is for uh, tibia uh, soft tissue uh, tibia uh, coverage because fracture are, uh, tibia fracture are often exposed on the uh, anteromedial side of the tibia, uh, where the tibia is just under the skin. So for the tibia coverage, there are two kinds of muscle that you, uh, of uh, flat transfer that you can use. Muscle flap uh, for the uh, proximal and uh, middle uh, third of the, of the tibia, and a fasciocutaneous flap at any level but uh, uh, mostly for the distal serve, because you see on this leg, you can see on the leg, you have muscle on the, uh, on the proximal and middle serve, but you have no muscle, of course, at the distal serve. So you cannot perform uh, muscle flap uh, for the distal uh, tibia. It's only a fasciocutaneous flap. On the contrary, you can uh, perform fasciocutaneous flap at any level. The most, the most simple uh, flap, uh, and most of the time we, we, when, you know, we, we start with the, the, this kind of flap because it's very easy to, to perform. It's the, the medial gastrocnemius flap, which is uh, indicated for uh, the proximal third of the tibia or for the distal femur. Uh, I show you uh, this uh, example uh, several times. You have a large defect on the proximal tibia here. Uh, we apply here a, a cement spacer, to reconstruct the bone later. And uh, this very simple flap, it's uh, very, uh, very quick to do. Uh, we move the uh, medial gastrocnemius and we obtain a very good soft tissue coverage uh, in, this, uh, in this case. So use uh, medial gastrocnemius only for the proximal third of the tibia or the distal femur. Uh, but it's not uh, uh, indicated for the for the middle middle serve, uh, only proximal serve. For the middle serve of the tibia, uh, you can use uh, a soleus flap. It's uh, also uh, not complicated to do for an orthopedic surgeon because we are used to uh, manage the um, the muscles. So uh, for us, for orthopedic for orthopedic surgeon, uh, performing a muscle flap it's easier than performing uh, fasciocutaneous. So for the middle side of the tibia, you can use a, a soleus flap. You have an example here with, of course, a secondary uh, skin grafting on the muscle. Uh, but the, the problem with the soleus flap is that uh, sometimes the, the muscle is injured uh, with, the, with the flap. Uh, so, sorry, so in this case, you cannot use uh, the, the solus, uh, of course. If not, you will have a, a, a failure. So in this case, you have no choice than to uh, use a fasciocutaneous flap. Uh, there are, in, in case of small defect, uh, you can use very, uh, very simple uh, fasciocutaneous flap that we call the bipedicule random flap. Uh, for it is very indicated for a small defect at any level, but mostly for a median defect. You can see here a secondary skin necrosis. You see typically what uh, uh, 
skin shelter under tension, under tension uh, exposed to, it's exposed to a secondary skin uh, necrosis with secondary bone exposure. This is a typical example of what I told you before. So for this small defect, you can use very simple flap. Actually, it's uh, only a lateral and medial incision, so counter incision, and you uh, perform then a subfacial dissection, dissection, subfacial. It's very critical to to uh, be uh, under the, the to uh, uh, to progress under the fascia uh, to preserve the the, the skin uh, vascularization, and uh, by these two uh, lateral uh, and, and medial incision, uh, you can move the flap and close uh, uh, and close the uh, and close the wound uh, on on the fracture site, and you will let the donor site on spontaneous healing. Here you have muscle and muscle here also. So this is a very, very useful trick to, uh, to uh, perform soft tissue coverage or small defect. You see three uh, centimeter uh, wide maximum, but you can use this at any level, uh, including at the distal third of the, of the TV. Other uh, conventional uh, fasciocutaneous flap you can use uh, very easily is the great saphenous flap. The great saphenous flap, it's a flap which is harvest on the uh, saphen medial saphenous bone and nerve. So it's, it's, it's easy, it's, uh, here it's, you can use, a, a, I don't remember the name in English, but very simple flaps, you're preserving the, the skin here. So uh, I don't remember, okay. So you, you just perform, a, very simple uh, drawing like this. And you can use this great saphenous flap for the proximal and the middle third of the tibia. So for example, if you have a, a, a fracture at the middle third and the soleus is uh, injured, so you can use the great saphenous flap uh, to uh, perform a skin coverage. You can use also, we will see later, this flap as a cross leg flap to repair the, the opposite leg. So uh, it's very easy. Uh, you see here the, the defect, the, the skin incision, and you, you, you preserve the, the proximal skin and you just have to rotate uh, the flap on the, on the defect. <coughs> As you can, a cutaneous flap can also uh, be a cross-leg flap uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, cover a very large defect. Uh, with cross leg flap, uh, you can, as you can see here, you can combine uh, two cross leg flap, for example, and uh, you, you can manage very large defect or, uh, or, or sometimes small defect, but which are complicated to, to, co uh, to cover at the distal, at the distal uh, tibia or at the ankle or foot. But uh, remember that uh, only uh, fasciocutaneous flap can be used for cross leg flap because this flap must be autonomized later. You cannot perform a cross leg flap using muscle. Huh? So only for fasciocutaneous flap. Uh, there's a cross leg flap or two stage procedure huh? uh, separate from uh, four weeks. The time of the flap uh, become autonomized on the, on the, on the, uh, on the wound. Huh? Here the, you have the, the injury was here and the, the donor legs is the, is the right one. And as you can see here, we perform a very large flap uh, using all the posterior skin of the, of the, of the cuff. Then uh, we use in this case an external fixator to prevent any traction on the, on the, on the pedicule to, to protect the flap. Uh, the, the fixator is just here to protect the flap. It was, in this case, there is no fracture. It was only a, a skin problem. There's no fracture. The external fixator is just here to uh, avoid the, the patient move his legs. So the fixator protect the pedicule between the two stage and the, the two stage. The second stage is of course the flap division, which uh, must be performed after uh, ideally uh, four weeks. And before you perform the flap division, you it's uh, it's better to perform a clampage test to uh, to check the flap autonomization before. Usually, this cross leg flap. The, in this closed flap, the pedicle can be divided after uh, three weeks, but uh, in our practice, we wait one week more. So 
if you to be sure of that, you 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 perform the, the this clampage test at three weeks, and if you see that your flap is not totally autonomized, you wait one week more. You can actually use different kind of flap, but you can also combine this flap together to repair a large soft tissue defect, thanks to the uh, principle of musculocutaneous dissociation. So you can combine easily uh, muscle flap together. For example, if you have a large defect on the proximal and medial third, you can combine the medial gastrocnemius and soleus flap. But you can also uh, combine uh, muscle flap and uh, um, fasciocutaneous flap. So uh, it's uh, even if you have a large soft tissue defect, most of the time you can uh, uh, do uh, by your own uh, soft tissue coverage without the need of a free flap. So uh, you are here an example, the example of, the, of this patient I show you uh, first. So uh, after the debridement, we have a large uh, defect with bone exposure, and in this case. So tissue coverage was performed combining a medial gastrocnemius and a, a distal a sural flap. It's another kind of flap, as you can see the, the, the result. But the, in this case, the problem was uh, the persistence of infection. So uh, when you have very large effect like this in low resource setting, if the, when the patient arrives, there's already an infection. Sometimes it's difficult to... Uh, to uh, be sure that the infection is uh, controlled. And if it's not the case, uh, you will have you will face many problems after. So, if you have very large defect uh, with a, a wound already infected, some time you have to consider a, a secondary amputation, like I told you, uh, because uh, even if you try to, to 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 save the limb, you will have uh, uh, you, you, you you risk to face uh, many uh, infectious complication and reconstruct reconstructive uh, failure. So we can talk also of, of the upper extremity reconstruction. Though there are many flaps, I will not, uh, of course, uh, detail all the flaps. But uh, the, at the upper extremity, there are two locations where you uh, you need a flap. Usually, it's for the elbow and for the end coverage. So for the elbow, you can use local flap for small defects, but you can also use uh, the latissimus dorsi flap, huh, the a pedicle one. It's a huge flap, but it's not complicated to do to cover uh, a large defect of the uh, anterior or the posterior side of the elbow. In this case, we use the, the um, we use a, a composite flap with a muscle and skin, but it's more uh, easy to perform only a, a, a muscle flap without uh, skin uh, paddles. It's, it's very easy to do. Uh, it's, it's more easy to do than this. And you can, uh, if you use a, a muscle flap, you just add a skin grafting. For the end, it's the same principle. You can use local flap. Many local flap are described for small defect. And if, but if you have large defect at the end, uh, this is a, a, a blast injury of the end. You see a very large defect. Uh, uh, we perform that in in Afghanistan with uh, with low resource. Uh, you can you can uh, perform a, a groin flap to cover the the end with the groin flap. You can cover the end, but you can also cover the the forearms and, and until the the elbow. So as you can see, uh, with uh, the uh, latissimus dorsi flap and with the groin flap, you can cover uh, all the upper limbs large defect of the upper limbs. So now we have uh, performed the delay primary closure. So uh, the wound is closed now. So it's the time we can perform the definitive bone fixation. We already uh, saw that. When we use a temporary external fixation, there are uh, subsequently two options. <coughs> Either we will move to a definitive external fixation or to an internal fixation. Uh, but in case of uh, uh, in case of gustilo 3b injury, uh, of course, the soft tissue coverage uh, is uh, must be done uh, before if you perform an internal fixation, for example. So we already uh, saw this uh, this uh, this figure. 
So in case of bucidal 3 injury, most of the time, we will choose a definitive external fixation at the tibia level. But we saw that uh, for upper extremity or femur, internal fixation is possible. Obviously, at that level, uh, bucidal 3 b injury are uh, much uh, are less frequent. So for tibia fracture, to summarize, for tibia fracture, you uh, external fixation is preferred uh, for soft tissue reconstruction when you have a gustilo 3 3B. Uh, but if you have a gustilo 1 or 2, of course, you can perform an ideal internal fixation if you can, or if you're in very uh, low resource setting, only a castor plast is, uh, is possible after the, the, the skin is closed. For femur fracture, uh, most fracture of the femur are gustilo 1, 2, or 3A. It's very seldom to have a large defect uh, exposing the bone because you have many muscle, many soft tissue around the femur. So uh, intramedullary nailing is uh, often a uh, prefer and it's uh, much more easy to achieve bone union with a nail than with an external fixator. So most of the time we use intramedullary nailing at the, at, at the femur when possible, of course. In very low resource setting, if you're on if you are on the field and the patient cannot be evacuated to an hospital, uh, skeletal traction is a good option uh, for femur fracture. But the patient will wait uh, two to three months with this skeletal traction, traction. but it's, uh, it's a good option uh, in very low uh, resource setting. And for the upper extremity fracture, uh, as we discussed before, uh, external fixation uh, should be avoided to have a, a a good uh, functional uh, outcome. So internal fixation is preferred, especially for the humerus and the forearm, but sometimes external fixation is required and can provide good results, uh, like in this case uh, of uh, proximal humerus fracture. So uh, to conclude, uh, what are the take home message? Uh, first, uh, the appropriate wound decontamination is really uh, the, the, the core of the of that management. And it's the prerequisite of any reconstruction procedure. If you uh, don't perform a good debridement, you will have secondary infection and you will have flap failure, you will have bone reconstruction failure. So the most important is to perform an appropriate wound decontamination with serial debridement if uh, in heavy, heavily contaminated wound. And next, you, we have seen today that soft tissue coverage can be achieved by non-specialized surgeon, by autosurgeon, for example, uh, with a simple pedicle flap in most cases. And if you have large defect, but if the wound is clean, you can cover uh, by combination of uh, different uh, pedicle flap. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm done. Hello, thank you, Professor. Uh, the, the, there are some many questions. Yeah, question, you... yes. Oh, the question. Ah, yes, many questions. So <laughs> many questions, so many questions. Yes. <laughs> right. Oh, what did you hear today? Do you need to make a major or two? I pass my age, I do pass my age, I do ya. But you might not have been a problem. So I will read the question. Uh, do you give look at an aesthetic when you debride a wound? Debride a wound? Uh, no, because we uh, most, uh, we can perform uh, most of the time it's general anesthesia because this patient have a severe uh, wound, and but sometimes the anesthesiologist can uh, perform a local regional anesthesia, but local no. The the surgeon cannot. Uh, cannot perform a, a proper uh, anesthetic, I think, except for small wound at the end, for example. But if you have to debride the wound on, on, a, on, on, a, on, a, on a leg, uh, except if it's uh, very superficial, for example, you can have very superficial wound. Uh, so in this case, yes. But uh, if you have a severe wound, of course, you must uh, go to the OT and uh, do it with an anesthesiologist. But if you have a, for example,